during this expert group meeting on promoting empowerment of people in achieving poverty eradication, social integration and full employment and decent work for all, we also wanted to give room to your questions, the questions we re received from you followers through Twitter, Facebook, and also by replying to our survey. So we have selected, as we promised, the most important questions, although they were all important, but those that were more pertinent maybe to the theme of this EGM. And uh, before we start the, the session on questions collected from our social media channels, uh, we would like to thank everyone who has a shared input and questions on people's empowerment. And we great, greatly, greatly value your input. So I will start with the first question, which was submitted on Facebook by Miss Amara uh, Shahbaz. Uh, so the question is, how can we make people realize that they are involved? Uh, Thank you very much, Amara. I wonder, can I rephrase your question slightly? Um, can I turn it to say, how are people aware that they are empowered? Not how can I make them aware, but how are they aware? because I can't make them do anything, I hope. And my answer to that is twofold. One is I think that it's important that we have a sense that we can pursue our aspirations. Not necessarily that we can achieve them, but that we can pursue them. And if we have that sense, then I think we have the beginning of being empowered. And the second thing I would say is that we have a sense that we're listened to, that we're accepted for ourselves, and that our ideas will be listened to. Not necessarily accepted, but that they will be listened to. So for me, the answer is much more about our sense of ourselves and our sense of where we live within the society that we belong to. Thank you. Thank you. I also agree that we cannot uh, make people do anything and, uh, and we shouldn't worry about that because uh, at the end of the day, people empower themselves individually and through their collective mobilization. Uh, and they will feel it when they are empowered. Uh, think about the Arab Spring. Uh, or USA at the time when Obama got elected first time as president, uh, or South Africa when Nelson Mandela was released from Robben Island, uh, people knew that something was in the air, something was changing, and they wanted to be part of that process. We need also measurement of uh, empowerment to convince and encourage policymakers, but uh, people will know themselves. I also agree with the others that you can't really force people to be empowered. It's something that you can do yourself. And at the most basic level, the start of the empowering process is respectful listening. That if people feel they've been listened to, their dignity has been upheld, then they start believing in themselves. It's the same spirit of the inside cat to make a difference in whatever aspect of life you think is important. The second thing that I think is important is changing rules and regulations that enable or that help people uh, access resources. And let me just give you a few simple examples. So the right to choose is very important, and that is facilitated by having access to information. So for example, if a woman doesn't have information about availability of contraceptives, there's no way she can choose to uh, uh, choose to birth, uh, spread out the birth of children or to choose to stop having children. Second is the right to negotiate and question. That it's not just a passive uh, receiving of information, but actively using that information to negotiate changes that impact you positively. And third example would be the right to organize. In, in India, for example, we have lots of lots millions of women who have been poor, very poor, very marginalized, and through the food process have been involved in self-help groups where they're challenging not just the uh, men who come to give them a particularly low price for the maize that they grow, because poor meat people buy and sell in very small quantities to have no bargaining power. And so when collectively when women get organized, they have strength in their numbers, so they're not afraid. And the same thing in the interactions with governments. These poor women who've been always ignored are going to local governments and challenging them on corruption. And then once the media picks it up, uh, there's a revolution. Uh, a characteristic of being empowered is that you know you are. And because you participate in key decision-making in your community, 
and you believe that you can influence decision-making about your life. It's one of the conditions of empowerment that you realize that you are empowered. Um, our second question was submitted by Aileen Serrato Calvario, and the question is, how can we empower people if social services, budget allocation in developing countries are cut? But the truth is, empowerment is not caused by the social services or the public bu budgets in the countries, but rather <clears throat> by the institutional structure and the types of actions taken by those who want to increase participation, and by the, pe <clears throat> by the people themselves. They do that by examining their problems and their causes and determining what they can do about them by their participation. And they can, by their actions, help address the reduction in social services and the problems with budget allocations. To follow what John has said, the answer to this question is that people need information to uh, both organize and to know what it is that they can do uh, to deal with the problems caused by the cut in budgets and social services. And there are lots of examples around the world of citizen monitoring, uh, which involves people organizing and negotiating for change. And it seems to me that this is a very important principle that's been mentioned before, but particularly when essential things uh, in relation to social services are cut. People can feel their power by organizing to get information, by organizing to know what exactly is available, to seek for change and to self-help. And uh, the principle of advocacy and negotiation for policy change and budgets is um, a, a long-held one and it's very important that people feel their strength uh, to, to make changes in this way. So the question is how best to target mainstream and accelerate empowerment for the least empowered? We've been talking a, a, a great deal in this uh, meeting about um, the provision, the public sort of provision of services, the policy environment to support empowerment, which isn't to say the individual issue isn't equally as important. But I, I mean, one very important thing for um, accelerating empowerment is that everybody has access to the basics of income and health. They are core things which all people require throughout the life course. And to back that up, it's important that there are standards and norms to protect people who feel and experience disempowerment through discrimination and unequal access. So uh, participation, which is also um, a principle of empowerment, must be, must be assured through standards and norms. And it, it seems very important that there be affirmative policies for people who are at risk of disempowerment, and these will be the very poor, disabled, older people, and so on, to ensure that they are consulted about the design of services and um, that their opinions are taken into account at all levels. Um, the fourth question was submitted by Gia Gaspar Taylor from our survey. Um, the question is, we learned quite a great deal through the social media and the internet. However, the very poor and rural communities are in most cases without basic amenities. How can they be helped via ICTs? Well, I think there are good examples already of ICT facilities being made available. In rural India, for example, they have these, what they call the holes in the wall, I haven't time to check out the name. And I think the evidence is that people use them. And, and they, it's partly a question of making the services available, but helping people with any lack of skills they have in order to be able to use them. 
And it's not that expensive to do this. You know, the kind of schemes that, that have been done are really quite cheap. So no government can say the problem is it's too expensive. It's really a question of political will to roll them like and make them available. Thank you very much. Now we will move to the last question, which will be answered by all the editors. And the question is, do you think that empowerment should be included in the, in the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, in post-2015 uh, agenda and other United Nations strategies at all levels? And I think yes, but uh, there needs to be uh, uh, a clear agreement on what we mean by empowerment. So we need to, to work better on the definition. We can put it in post-2015. I am Dr. Nadao from Jordan, and I, I can't agree more that yes, but it has to be defined as a thing, and we should make sure that we reach a common understanding for what we mean by empowerment, especially when it comes to social groups. I mean, by empowering youth, I think youth was uh, I mean, maybe missed from the MDGs, uh, it was not an main area. I think empowering youth has to be one of the, the main issues in the ocean. My name is Olympus Kachalani. Um, in balance, I would imagine yes. Uh, the bottom line is irrespective of whether you know I'm in favor or not. I think um, what matters is whether people demand and work towards empowerment. And if they do so, I think sooner or later they will get it. So the individual opinion is nice that you have asked us, but it is neither here or, 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 or there. Thanks very much. Empowerment is, in fact, an essential means for achieving the MDG goals, and if they and the post-2015 uh, objectives are really to be achieved, empowerment must be an essential part of the achievement strategy. Um, well, uh, I agree, yes. Uh, though I think empowerment comes about through inclusive, um, rights-based, equitable policies. So the goals must deliver uh, those things. And um, we could settle on some principles. We haven't actually got the definition yet, but we could settle on some principles that, for the framework, that they are derived from the human rights framework, that they're life course focused, they deliver to people across all sectors, and uh, they recognize contributions and support them of all people in whatever walks of life. And then we might get some results, and measurements must reflect that. My name is Timo Boitio. I'm from Finland. Um, I'm probably a dissident in the group because I don't think that uh, empowerment should be included in the post-2015 uh, goals or agenda. It's a sociological term that's too complicated to be included, but we do indeed have to uh, include measures that promote empowerment, like land rights, social protection for all, inclusion of persons with disabilities and other socially excluded groups. These measures together, in effect, promote empowerment. On the post-2015 agenda, we should include some of these issues that were actually absent uh, on the MDG agenda. And I agree with Silvia that uh, we can uh, make the agenda a human rights-based agenda. We can move from poverty reduction to inequality reduction, I believe. We can promote social protection and decent work for all, actually, we can promote a society for all. Ben McCartney, um, uh, I would be inclined to have something in the, in the post millennial Development Goals agenda, which would be to do with the uh, empowerment. But I think the wording is very careful, and it may be that we may find a wording that satisfies the theme and myself, I don't know. Because it's about taking away the things which disempower people is what, in a sense, we're looking for. And it may not be expressed simply by saying empowerment's a good thing. I don't think that would be meaningful. But we may well want to say things which indicate that empowerment is on the agenda without actually putting it in that form. I would be absolutely yes. I think the challenge is to uh, measure empowerment 
And perhaps the best way of moving forward is to look at, come up with measures of both responsive governance and responsiveness, responsive market my name is Jeff Edit. I uh, have not yet decided where I stand in this issue, but I do think that it's very important that we're clear about what we mean by empowerment. And um, I think one thing that's come out in these discussions is that we're taking an approach that understands empowerment both as the individual and collective uh, capabilities and actions of people who are seeking to reduce their poverty and, and have a and be more included in society. And we're also talking about uh, efforts that can change the conditions in which those choices and actions are taken and uh, the conditions which might prevent people from making those choices and taking those actions. And those are conditions which are economic, political, institutional, and also embedded in the, in the social norms, values, and psychological dimensions um, that enable and constrain people. So we're not only talking about empowering people, we're talking about creating an, envi an enabling environment for people to be able to make choices and take actions in their interests. I have a somewhat nuanced yes that empowerment should be in the NG. So I don't think too much time should be spent on actually um, having whole sections on empowerment. Where there should be a thread that runs throughout your payment of the NGs. Um, I take this opportunity to respond very quickly to a previous question on ICTs and people in rural areas. Um, there is a lot that's going on already through the use of um, uh, mechanisms such as community radio and mobile phone technology um, to reach people in rural areas and also positive have a strong role in reaching people in rural areas. Hello, friends. My name is Ming and I represent the Energy Community for Social Development. My opinion is that an apartment as a post status will contribute to the achievement of the NGTs as well as defining a post of the development agenda. In addition to comments offered by the experts, Thus far, there are also certain principles are well understood about empowerment. A great deal of learning seems to be done. Some key questions need to be asked. For example, how are the ideals of empowerment translated into practical, on the ground realities of varying situations? How can empowerment be, be measured? What kinds of interventions have most impact on empowerment? To what mechanisms does empowerment translate into improve outcomes? So questions such as these need to be at the heart of discussions about MDGs, about post-entity development agenda, and about uh, the United Nations strategies at all. Hello, my name is Maxima, I'm a professor of international legal education. I think that uh, empowerment should be included, but as uh, it has to be well-defined, better defined, and it is very hard to find the nature of empowerment. This is going to be hard to have empowerment as a target. So, and the empowerment in itself can be a target, but maybe it can be a need. So, empowerment should be included, defined, and, and use other targets to see whether they are achieving to empower. Thanks to all of you experts. Thank you to the online and social media followers. We have something more to say before uh, concluding this very interesting question time uh, by telling you that we would like you to keep following us. We will tell you how. And, uh, you know, send us your questions if you have any other considerations because this exercise, as I call it, just started what will come in the future. So thank you very much again, and thank you, thank you also to all our experts here who answered the questions. So I would just, you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash join UN DESA. And we can, we would like to hear again a lot from you, and thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you.